Welcome to Worlds of Tennis, presented by BNP Paribas. Each week, someone will be holding court with Justin Gimmelstab. This week, it's Pete Sampras. Pete opens up about his life now, his rivalry with Andre Agassi, and how he was able to go out on his terms. Well, Pete, thanks for joining us. What is a day in the life of Pete Sampras like now? Well, it's, it's a little different than it used to be. I um, get up pretty early with the kids and you know, get them off to school. I hop in the gym at 10 o'clock till 12. I, from there, I either go play golf, um, pick up my kids from school, bring them home, get them to do some homework, play a little poker. I used to play basketball, but not anymore. Um, and just try to keep a, a life of keeping myself in motion, you know, just trying to keep myself um, with a schedule that's structured. And I just think working out, being in the gym is important for me. Do you believe that your talent was overrated while your work ethic and your will were underrated? I, I believe that's the case. I, I believe my will was one of my strongest assets that I, people that knew me, like, you know, I wasn't like Rafa that was being all energetic. I was a little more subdued, but I, I had the strong will to just win every match I played, to stay number one, to win majors. I wasn't always like that. I didn't really feel that until I was about 23. And so I was talented, I had this big serve, I moved well, I, I did all these really good things, but people didn't see sort of the will that, um, that, you know, that I have. I mean, I was strong-willed, I was stubborn, I was in my own little world, I isolated myself from a lot of people and just, you know, that's the way I felt like I had to be at that time to stay number one was I couldn't be everyone's friend. I didn't have the time for it. I just was focused on winning, and, and that was my deal. And it came across a little bit like that in interviews or press conferences at majors. I was very quiet, kept to myself. I was all about winning, and that was, that was my style. Where did that will come from? Well, it came from one loss. One loss, a 92 U.S. Open final. I remember waking up playing Edberg. I woke up not nervous, um, happy I got to the final. Um, just, I did it. And I remember playing the match, I lost the match, and I felt like I sort of gave in in the match. I didn't fight hard, I didn't dig deep, and it bothered me, like I sort of, I quit. And I think I took that feeling for the rest of my career that I would never let that happen again. And I just felt like I was a little soft. You know, I didn't have that competitive will, and that competitive, how, how bad do I want it? And so I, from that loss from the rest of my career, I just, I just changed my whole at outlook, my work ethic, just everything became just a little more serious. Pete, like a lot of people that are great at things, they make it look easy. You made it look easy. Is that one of the reasons you believe that people had a tough time connecting to how hard you had to work at it? Yeah, I think it was because I, I did have this big serve and this big game and everything looked pretty easy. and. You know, like it was not a lot of hard work went into it, not a lot of dedication. Like it was, it's a lot of work, a lot of dedication. And, and it was figuring out my, my life, uh, my lifestyle I wanted to lead. And I was willing to sacrifice more than the rest. And, you know, people see it, it, it looked easy and I moved well and it was fluid and um, it didn't happen overnight. You've always been sentimental and emotional, but you just didn't let people see it. Correct. Uh, there were certain, times and places and, and I sort of used tennis as an outlet for me in some ways that it was moments would make me uncomfortable or as a kid, I just used tennis. I was good at it um, as an escape in a way. Like, and, and, and it was all about me. You know, no one could get in the way of what I was trying to do. And I remember, you know, even when I played a little bit of Andre and Boris, you know, I was always a little intimidated by them with their aura. Like well, even walking out on the court with them, you know, it was Andre, and you hear all the stuff, and you're Boris, you know. But when once you start playing, all that stuff went away. All the anxiety, all the all the intimidation. I always remember that feeling. Like it's it's the ultimate one-on-one -on -one sport. There's no other. There's nothing that can really get in the way of that. It's interesting you mention Andre and Boris's aura. Yet deep down between the lines, you've always expressed, at least to me privately, that when it got just between the lines that you had tremendous self-belief yes. in that matchup. Yes. I just felt I was a little better. I just felt, you know, I didn't beat him every time I played him, but I don't know, I just, I just believed that I was better than everyone. Not in an arrogant way, I didn't, I didn't have to talk about it. I just, deep down, I knew I was, even when I was struggling, for those two years where I didn't win a title, like, I just still felt like I was the best player in the world. 
More holding court with Justin and Pete a little later on. But next, John Wertheim and the editors from Tennis.com debate where Serena Williams and Roger Federer are in their careers. We'll be right back. Worlds of Tennis is brought to you by BNP Paribas, the bank for a changing world. And by World Tennis Day, join the worldwide celebration March 3rd. For information, go to worldtennisday.com. Welcome back to Worlds of Tennis, presented by BNP Paribas. Serena Williams is the most dominant player on the women's tour, currently ranked number one. And even though she had a slight misstep in Australia, she's still seen as the player to beat. Roger Federer hasn't won a Grand Slam since Wimbledon 2012, has recently hired Stefan Edberg as his coach, and has seen his ranking fall to number eight. John Wertheim and the editors from Tennis.com, Peter Bodo, Tom Parada, and Andrew Freeman debate the future of these two greats in the sport. We have two tennis players, they're both 32 years old, born actually within a few weeks of each other. They each have 17 majors, but Serena Williams and Roger Federer at very different points in their career right now. Where do you, where do you see both of them going, Pete? Roger's such a terrific athlete, so light on his feet. He can, you know, he, he's got a couple more years in terms of being able to get around a court very well. He's had some back injuries, but other than that, he's never had one of those, you know, like two months off because of a tennis elbow or a badly sprained ankle or something like that. Serena, on the other hand, you know, she doesn't move all that much on a court unless she has to. So, I mean, she could be out there for a long time just nailing winners. So, you know, I, I think both of them have some serious, serious long-term potential still. Does that mean they're going to win Grand Slams? I think in Serena's case, the likelihood is very high. I think she's got a couple more majors in her for sure. Roger, I'm, I'm not so sure about Roger just because of how it's been going lately. I think Federer will be in the game longer than Serena. I just don't know that he'll be at the top longer than Serena. I, I, for some of the reasons that Pete said, he's very light on his feet. I think he's going to stick around. I think he could still win a major if the situation is right and you know he's playing well and the right player is not playing well or is not in the tournament or whatever the case may be. Serena can win you know no matter what as long as she's playing well. You know the other interesting thing to me is on the coaching front you know she has a relatively new coach and by both her account and the coaches although he's a little more polite about it it's really helped her game. You know usually at that stage you see what you see with Roger which is here's a guy who for years didn't have an official coach and you know, was cleaning up, dominating the game, and now he's making these sort of changes that feel a little desperate might be too strong a word, but like he's searching. You know, he's a little unsure of himself, which is something we're not used to seeing from him. The one other thing I do want to say though about him, because it always comes to mind for me, is Pete Sampras. You know, for two years before he won that last U.S. Open, people were screaming for Pete Sampras to retire. Fans wanted him to retire. Wimbledon defeat, a lot. Yeah, of but not just that. No titles. I mean, right, Federer right, hasn't right. got a year without a title and right. he's still making it deep in slams. And I think Federer believes it could happen and he knows better than we do. I think one thing about him that maybe doesn't get talked about enough that makes me think he will stick around for a while is that he knows everybody likes to watch him play and they're, you know, there's, he's still the most popular guy out there of, of the men or right there. Right. And he likes that, that everybody likes to watch him play and he wants to please in that way. I mean, I do think there's an aspect to him that says that, I'm an entertainer in some way too. It's not just about whether I'm number one. And I think he enjoys that feeling from crowds. And so that might keep him out there unless he really plummets in the rankings. In which case he's not playing that much anyway. I say you should play mixed doubles with Serena. They could, they could both play until 45 like Martini did exactly. <laughs> and people will get to see him. No, I mean, we were talking about two of the greats of all time, Serena and Federer. And I think how they play out in 2014 is a top shelf storyline. Thanks, Tennis.com. When we come back, there's more holding court with Justin and Pete Sampras on World of Tennis, presented by BNP Paribas. Welcome back to World of Tennis, presented by BNP Paribas. Now back to holding court with Justin and Pete Sampras. Who was your greatest rival? Well, I think most, for the most part, it was Andre. He was a phenomenal player and did a lot of things that uh, I didn't like on the court, you know, he returned well and um, made me move a lot and made me work on my service games. He was a great competitor, he moved well. I mean, just, he was a great player and, and he had that extra gear that not a lot of guys had. Do you like Andre? Yeah, you know, we, we, we competed hard. We, we fought for majors. We fought for the best player in the world for a few years. And through the whole competitive days, we got along quite well. 
respectful through the media. There wasn't any bad blood. And, you know, we've had a few awkward situations since we retired and just... Does that emanate from the fact that you guys are just so different in every possible way? I think it is. I think we look at things a little differently and we play differently. Our personalities were different. I think Andre looked at me as a little too single-minded and, you know, I might have looked at him as, you know, a little too flamboyant or a little bit um, up and down with his career and how do you go from one in the world to 120 in the world? You know, I, I you know, it was just sort of touch and go for a few years there. How tough was that towards the end of your career when everyone started doubting you and people actually started blaming Bridget? Yeah. And it's always ironic because they spent so much of your career criticizing you for being so single-minded. Then you fall in love with this amazing woman and then they start blaming you for losing focus. And that was a huge theme down the stretch and a huge source of motivation down the stretch as well. Well, being away from the sport and, and watching ESPN, I mean, it, it's the media's job. That's what they do. I mean, they look at McElroy's, his girlfriend's the problem. And you know, it, it, it's, it's part of the business. But at the time when I was in it, I was, I was, I was hurt. I, I mean, not hurt, but I was, I was pissed that you know, I, have, I had this incredible career. I met this great lady. I was struggling at the time, and they blamed her, and it was just it wasn't fair. You know, they had taken personal shots at my wife. It didn't really sit w well with me. I was just, I felt a little lost. You know, like she was going through it. I wasn't playing well. I changed coaches. Like it was, I went through a year there where I was really just struggling to find my way. The media, they, they're tough. I mean, they're, they, one day you're a hero, the next day, what's wrong? When are you going to retire? And when you, deal with that for a couple years, you start believing it. Like, am I done? Should I stop? I mean, look at Roger now. I mean, people are asking him all the time. So you have to do your best to, to be in your own little world like I'm good at. I had a horrible Wimbledon, lost second round of Boston. I was as low as I could be. I mean, I was just lost and got together with Paul and just he gave me some confidence. We talked about my tennis and just that belief that I that I lost, I finally figured it out. Like I got it back a little bit, like just believing in myself and, and um, that I could, I could win another major. Is that one of your proudest achievements with everything stacked against you, going to that last US Open, having really nothing to build on? You lost to Paul Henry Matu in Long Island. You lost to Wayne Arthurs in the summer, Tommy Haas. You had a brutal run there, yet deep down somewhere, you still believed that you could do it. Deep down, I strongly believe that I could, I, that I could maybe do it. It was a definite maybe. I didn't, I didn't know if I could, but I was, I was going to try. And so I just, I, as, as low as I was and, and no confidence, I just still believe I had this game that I could, I could get it going. I can get my serve going. I can get some confidence, start moving a little better. Like it's, you get into this flow. And I did it, you know, and I felt vindication through just where I was, was a couple months ago, through a little bit of the media, through... My wife was there, who was pregnant at the time. It was like all, all came full circle, and it felt great. And, and I had the last word, which was, which was nice. I mean, I'm not one of those, that, hey, I told you so, but I, I did it in my own way. Is it tough to see some of the things that meant a lot to you and the accomplishments minimized or matched or exceeded by other players? You know, at the time, you, you want your records to last. You really do. It's just that's sort of the, maybe the competitor in me. But at the same time, you know, when someone breaks your record, you, someone like Roger, who I like and is a friend, you applaud him and you accept it and there's nothing I can do about it today. I did what I did in the 90s and I thought 14 would last a while. It lasted about seven years, eight years, but I was happy for him. I mean, I'm not one of those, I don't root against people. Uh, I think he's a credit to the game and, um, you know, in the next year or two, I think Rafa very well is going to pass me and it's just a... It's where the sport's at. You just have these three or four guys dominating the game. But records are made to be broken, that old, old cliche. And so mine, I'm happy with the 14. I don't feel minimized. I don't feel anything, but I was the player of my time, and that's, I'm happy with that. Venus and Serena Williams growing up said that you were their idol. And now you have players like Dimitrov, who everyone compares to Federer, but he really looks up to you. Does that mean something more to know that these current players are still so conscious of what you accomplished? I'm flattered. I really, truly am flattered that um, you're right, you know, um, Djokovic has been nice and, and Milos Ronic has been nice. Like it's, you know, Labor was my guy and I'm sure every time I mentioned him, he felt pretty good ab about it and, and it is flattering. I don't, I don't need it. I don't, I'm not looking for it, but it is, it is nice to hear when, 
when guys playing today or say, you know, I looked up to Pete and the way he played and the way he acted, it, it feels pretty good. Could you ever imagine that the sport would have progressed the way it has in terms of the physicality? I, I didn't see that coming. I really didn't see it coming. Everyone's sort of playing the same way and technology has really gotten better. And I figured there'd still be some serve and volley tennis, some a little bit of mixture in there. You know, if you look at it, you have, you know, potentially three players that have, have won all the majors. And I just that's just rare. I didn't see Roger winning 17 majors. He's done great. And, you know, someone like Rafa to, to go from the, from the clay, France to win Wimbledon two weeks later, like I didn't see that happening. And, you know, it's the nature of the sport and where it's at. Um, and everyone's staying back. He's able to win Wimbledon. Would you like that matchup, you playing in a doll at Wimbledon with him staying back? I, I love anyone staying back at Wimbledon. That was, that was, you know, that was my deal. If you were staying back at Wimbledon, you're, you know, I just was licking my chops. I just felt like I could, you know, I don't know. I just, I, you know, I didn't like playing big servers at Wimbledon. I didn't like playing Goran. I didn't like, I didn't like playing Krychek. Is there one thing that tennis has taught you the most? Nothing's given to you in tennis. If you're ranked sixth in the world, you're sixth in the world. What you put into it, you're going to get out of it. Like, there's no shortcuts in tennis. There's no, no flukes. You know, it's one of those sports that, you know, you're not handed a Wimbledon trophy. You know, you have to earn it. And I, and I love that about tennis. You, you're not handed, handed anything, you know, and, and where you, you're all ranked, that's where you're ranked. That's where you deserve to be ranked. Um, and there's no, no help. It's an independent sport. It's on, you're on your own. It, it, it's, there's some really great things about tennis that people don't talk about. I mean, it's the ultimate one-on-one -on -one sport. And, and I've always liked that about, about tennis. You can show, see someone's true character. You know, when they're not feeling well, they get a bad call and they lose it for 10 minutes. I mean, it's exposing this game. You can't hide. And so I just feel like that's one of those things I've learned about the sport and about myself is that, about my will, is that, you know, that I, I had it. You know, and not everyone has it. Thanks, Pete. Time now for this week's Getty Images on Tour. Andy Murray and Great Britain eliminated the United States from Davis Cup and gave Great Britain its first rule group victory since 1986. American Donald Young replaced an injured John Isner and lost the first match to Murray. In the second match, Sam Querrey lost in a shocking collapse to James Ward. The Bryan brothers put the U.S. on the board but Andy Murray proved too much with a four-set, fourth rubber win over Sam Querrey. Great Britain will next travel to Italy, who defeated Argentina. Thanks, Getty Images. We'll be right back. World of Tennis is brought to you by BNP Baribas, the bank for a changing world. And by the BNP Paribas Showdown. See Djokovic, Murray, the Bryans, and the McEnroe brothers, March 3rd at Madison Square Garden. Welcome back to World of Tennis, presented by BNP Paribas. Time for Justin's final take, brought to you by Tennis Express. The most entertaining matchups in sports come when the competitors have contrasting styles. The Sampras Agassi rivalry is one of the best tennis has ever experienced. Sampras Agassi contrasts each other in every way, both on and off the court. Sampras' on-court style consisted of him always attacking, imposing himself on you with his explosive power and forward pressure, the quintessential serve and volleyer, always challenging you. Agassi was a perfect foil, the most aggressive returner the sport has ever seen, taking huge cuts at every opportunity. Their matchups were comparable to a great fastball pitcher like Bob Gibson against a great fastball hitter like Hank Aaron. Agassi's bludgeoning ground strokes always trying to wear down Sampras and keep him pinned behind the baseline, or zeroing in relentlessly on Pete's backhand. Their personalities and demeanors amazingly varied even more than their playing styles. Sampras never wanted to let you in, never wanted to show his opponent or the public any element of who he was or how he ticked. Agassi wanted, even needed you, to go along on the journey with him. Andre cared about everything going on around him. Pete benefited from his singular focus and isolation. I have the ultimate respect and enjoy my friendship with both of them, but their differences are what makes their rivalry so compelling, even now. Thanks, Tennis Express. Now here's a look at the upcoming tour schedule brought to you by Wilson.
For more of Justin's interview with Pete Sampras, you can go to StarGamesInc.com. The next episode of World of Tennis premieres Wednesday, February 19th at 6 p.m. In the next Holding Court, Justin spends time with Andre Agassi. See you next time on World of Tennis, presented by BNP Paribas.